Hi there, friends. So I want to offer a review of two decks that are pretty new to my collection. I think they're pretty new in the world. I've had these for a couple weeks now, maybe three or four, and they were both decks that I was not aware of, uh, you know, up until they started appearing in my own YouTube feed. So there have been, I think, several videos on each of these, but I just wanted to share my own thoughts uh, about each. And... Uh, I wanted, you know, this one I actually talked about in another video when I had just gotten it, but I thought it would be worth just coming back and revisiting them because they're both really, really great works of art, and they're also decks that I, I don't know uh, if they will wind up entering my repertoire. So it's an interesting thing how we can really, really admire and like a deck and, and be happy that it's in the world and at the same point know that it probably won't become, you know, a working deck. So... The, let's look at the Tower at the End of the World for, or the Carnival at the End of the World uh, first, because I um, have probably less to say about this one than the others. Let me go ahead and zoom in. Yoink. So, this is an interesting deck. It's really beautifully done. Now, I'm going to preface this for anyone who thinks this way. Um, uh, I did not put either of these in order, and I decided not to actually on purpose because I really, you know, you can see a walkthrough of these decks, but these are really more reviews in this case. And uh, the other thing is that I kind of like when someone's talking about a deck and it's not in order so that I can get, uh, you know, a, a better picture of the whole deck because I'm not going to do a walkthrough of the whole thing. So this is Carnival at the End of the World, um, and, uh, you know, like the, like the, um, Tower of Musterberg, there's a bit of a, a created mythology around this, which is fun. Uh, it's hard to see it, but it says Madame Lulu presents the carnival at the end of the world from her book of fate. And then on the back, the artist credit are actually there, Khan and Silasnik. And uh, I went back and forth on this one. I tend to pull the trigger more easily with independent decks because they tend to go out of print. And also because I don't, even if I don't end up liking it, I, I don't really have, at the moment anyway, I have the, the income to, to get the decks, and so I have no problem supporting independently produced artists because I want them to continue, and I want to see more indie decks come out. I think indie decks, by and large, are my, you know, the ones that I'm using primarily, or have used primarily in the last couple of years have been indie decks with some, you know, with some exceptions, or even small press. Um, so, anyway, uh, this is exactly the same size. I thought it was a little bit smaller, but it's not. It's exactly the same size as the Pagan Other Worlds. It is not the same production company, but the production quality is identical, and I think they used the same printer. So, uh, same size, and the box is really great. This is also the back of the cards. I just really love nice packaging, and that was one of the reasons why I turned around and got this. I did not get the book that goes with it. I frequently do not clientele with guidebooks because uh, when the option is there to not buy it, I know I'm not going to read it and it's just going to take up space in my already cluttered office. Uh, so, whoa, it's doing so well. There we go. Um, so this deck does come with extra cards that are not part of the tarot pack. Uh, probably my guess is that they are explained in the, the, the book, the guidebook, but there's Orlovsky, this beautiful Inferno card, I think it's really gorgeous. I mean, the art in this deck, the Deluge, the Tempest, uh, there's Madame Lulu herself, and, um, Dr. Falk. So I imagine all of these are explained within the mythology of the book. Um... <clears throat> this is definitely not a deck for everybody, and I did watch a few walkthroughs of this before I pulled the trigger. So I knew what I was getting into, and I really do like it. Now, I'm going to say that of, you know, cardstock like this, like the Pagan Other Worlds, this playing card cardstock, I actually find a little bit more difficult to work with than um, a slightly stiffer, slightly more resistant when there are this many cards, frankly. Uh, I think just, you know, they tend to go flying more easily, and they slip around, and it's just hard to be neat. And then when I'm laying them out, they're sliding against each other. 
this is, uh, you know, artistically, I really think this deck is breathtaking. I mean, look at that Queen of Pentacles. Is that not the Queen of Pentacles? This deck um, breathes really nicely because there's so much white space, and that's something I really respect. And it's not a bright, glaring white. It's a, it's a tempered white. The deck itself has environmental themes going on in it, and it's an interesting thing for a tarot deck to use, for example, climate change as a metaphor, uh, because by nature, that's a, you know, that's a really um, negative thing, right? Climate change isn't really doing anyone any favors at the moment. And as a result, you're sort of beginning with a, with a, a, a negative concept of, you know, sort of doom. Filtering the deck through that is an interesting thing. Now, one of the reasons why I wish I had gotten the guidebook is that I'd love to know if they intended this to be a reading deck or a collector's item. You know, I mean, for me, there's no difference. But the reality is that I'm, I don't collect. So when I'm looking at a deck to get, I'm, I'm thinking, can I read with this? Now, this one I kind of knew would be difficult, and I wouldn't be able to make up my mind, but I wanted to see it in person. And... So I have seen it in person, and I've done a few readings with it, and again, I think while the topic is climate change, the deck itself doesn't necessarily read in a negative way. It has a creepiness to it, or a, a otherworldliness to it, uh, but not so much that I, I find it um, offensive, you know what I mean? I don't know necessarily that I would pick this up and read for clients with it, though. And I think the reason why is partly because, um, you know, ultimately its tone is a little bizarre, and it's not... What I, what I tend to look for in a reading deck is a neutrality. And there is, there's a point of view here that isn't, you know, again, it's not super creepy, it's not super dark, it's not super negative, but there's an interesting point of view here that I can't help but think would color the expectation of someone I'm reading for. And of course, um, that, you know, you know what you're getting when you get a deck called Carnival at the End of the World, right? You know, you're not getting, like, something fun and, and fluffy. Obviously, there's, you know, there's a little bit of grimness associated with it, which I'm not opposed to, but, um... But yeah, I mean, I, I ha it's like I don't quite know how I feel about it. And a lot of the cards I really like, and a lot of them I'm sort of like, oh, that's interesting. So I have really mixed feelings about this deck, and I don't know that um, those will even out. And I think that's the intent of the artist, too. I don't think the intent, you know, I'm just gathering from looking at this, but when you see artwork like this, there's, there's a, there's a Dali-esque quality to it, um, Hieronymus Bosch-like quality to it. There's a, a surrealism and a darkness, and um, I don't think that that's meant to settle you. You know what I mean? This isn't a deck I don't think that's meant to settle your your uh, mind a little bit. I think it's meant to be unsettling in, a, in kind of a gentle way. But this is not, you know, this is not an everyday landscape. So, um, you know, I... As a work of art, again, I think this is really successful. Oh, I don't want the extra cards mixed in. I like to separate those out. Um, uh, I think it's successful as a work of art. You know what I mean? It's really, really beautifully done, really nicely produced, you know. And again, if, if this card stock is up your alley, it's really nice. And it does shuffle really well. It's, again, like the Peg in Other Worlds, it's a little large. Um, but, you know, it's super slippy, you know, it's just, it's literally playing cardstock. So, in that regard, uh, it's really cool. And, you know, it's just, I feel like as a reading deck, it's probably not likely to join the coalition, as it were. Um, I think, like, the, you know what this really reminds me of in a lot of ways? Is the Wooden Tarot, which, again, is another deck I really... Do I have that in reach? Yes. That's another deck I really liked and kind of went back and forth on. Uh, 
these two decks seem to have a similar uh, relationship in its kind of unsettling art style. Um, you know, it's a very different artistic statement, but there's uh, an, an uneasiness. There's a, um, a quality to this deck that's similar about things not being quite right or quite as we thought they were, as we understood them. You know, the wooden tarot, this tarot I really like. Again, it was another indie deck that I'd gotten, mostly because I was worried that it would go to print, and I had seen some walkthroughs. And I do like it, but I never use it. I think I've maybe tried one or two readings with it. And and not successfully. So, um, that's a, that's a, you know, it's, it's something I respect artistically, but that I don't, um, I just don't see myself using. Where, you know, can I imagine a situation where I might use this is, is maybe at um, a, a party or something where the tone was a little odd. But as a reader, it just doesn't suit my sensibility. You know, more and more I'm reaching for decks that do have a neutrality to them, which is sort of why I tend to go for uh, Marseille style and Pip decks, because they do tend to have a, a fairly neutral voice that allows me to you know, to figure out things in context, so. Then, you know, and that's not across the board. I, I, it's interesting, you know, because the one of the decks that I'm using most of the time now, uh, when I'm not using a Marseille deck, is the Jeparitza. Um And I don't know that I would call this deck necessarily neutral, uh, but I find that it reads really well, and I don't find that its voice is imposing, with the exception, of course, of the Emperor card, which everyone knows I'm not wild about, but it's like the one exception to the rule. And um, by and large, you know, I don't find that this deck has an imposing voice, where the Carnival at the End of the World, just the title alone, you know what I mean, has a, has a tone of voice. Um, but this one, not so much, you know, it just sort of, presents itself with these kind of abstract and interesting images, and and they speak. And, um, I don't know, this video isn't about this deck anyway, but I just wanted to compare. You know, a deck can be fairly neutral artistically, or it can have a really, you know, specific tone, and I think that the Carnival at the End of the World is not neutral. Um, even though, in a weird way, the artistic voice is neutral. I don't know, I don't know how to describe it, but beautiful, but probably won't be reading with it. Um, next up is the Naked Heart Tarot. I've seen this everywhere. And again, this was another deck that I did not back on Kickstarter or was it Indiegogo, I'm not sure. I only really saw it recently in the past few weeks and, and um, thought, oh, uh, you know, there's another one I've seen some walkthroughs of, but I want to get my hands on it and see how it feels. And this is a really interesting deck, because of the two, this one I could see myself using more, and yet I don't know that I will, and I'll talk about why. Let me talk first of all about indie artists, indie deck creators, and their attention to detail. I mean, the quality of this packaging um, is really beautiful. It, it, you know, I really do think in a lot of ways indie deck creators are surpassing mass market um, publishers in what they're capable of making, and it, it blows my mind. And that was another reason why I, I, I picked this up, was partly because it just looked like such a seductive thing to want to, you know, just pick up and hold. And I wanted to see what the cardstock was like, that was like, et cetera. So um, as a piece of marketing, it's really beautiful. And I know that um, Jillian Wilde, who's the author, artist, had some struggles with the original quality of the first print run, and, and I think, you know, what a noble thing to do to sort of, and expensive, to pull those off the line and, um, and redo it. Uh, so, bravo to that. I mean, that's, that's dedication. Uh, the quality continues into both the, obviously the box, whoops, and the deck itself and the guidebook. So there's the extra cards, there's an artist card. Um, and then the na I never, never leave extra cards in decks. It's just not my jam. Um, I've tried it. It's not for me. Uh, this is a really meaty guidebook um, for, for you know, what is essentially a little white book. And what I really think is successful about it, um, there's some stuff in, t in here about the fact that the back of the deck and this logo here is a crystal grid. Now, I don't know a whole lot about 
about that, um, so I can't really speak to that. But what I can speak to is the way that she's constructed the book in a sense of the card with some uh, key concepts, a description, um, she provides you a message, and then she also talks about additional meanings. She gives you reverse meanings, but the most important thing for me is the way that she talks about the symbolism that she used and why it's there. Uh, so that to me is, is great because I love, love, love to know why artists do what they do when it comes to making a deck. So really great guidebook. And again, just beautifully designed, great feel to it. A um, little hard to, you know, sit there and open unless you really want to do some damage to the binding. But, you know, it's your deck and you can do what you want. Um, the art itself is really beautiful. So um, again, this is the back and this is a crystal grid. Uh, but again, that's that's a little beyond my comprehension. And then um, the deck itself. So again, I'll zoom in. And uh, if you hear voices, there's people working in what is, I guess is the basement. I didn't realize this building had a basement. But. Um, so the deck, beautiful art. I love the combination of black and white line art and these really kind of beautiful, rich paintings. Uh... There, there, you know, there are a couple cards by my standards that I find a little, you know, a little cloying for my taste. You know, the the unicorn uh, moments; those things for me are just out of my out of my taste zone. Um, but you know, uh, like the four of pentacles, for example, a little cute, but like it's it's adorable, and I kind of can't not lo love it. But there are other ones that are just cute. The art, I really love simplicity. You know, I talked about how the carnival at the end of the world really breathes. This is a deck that breathes, too. Really, really open. A lot of white space. I love that. I would say that artistically, this is a far more neutral deck from tone of voice, from, from value judgment, than the, the previous one. Um, again, here's one of the unicorns. Uh, one of the things that I've noticed is it seems like sometimes the choices of animal... Uh, depicted on the card were deliberate and representational. Sometimes, just by my perception, they feel a little more arbitrary. Uh, but I don't know a whole lot of... Uh, um, I know only the slightest bit about animal energy and animal totems and, and the connections and associations of animals to certain things. You know, I know, for example, that foxes are not uncommon when it comes to the suit of wands and fire. Um... But, I mean, aesthetically, I really like this deck a lot. Um, and, and, you know, aesthetically, aside from a couple cards that I find a little cutesy for my taste, and all, there's only a couple, I really don't have anything negative to say about it. Uh, aesthetically, it's beautiful. Um, not, you know, the, the um, a high priest, this isn't my favorite high priestess, but I, I think it's great. I think it's fine. Um, and again, the quality of the art is really beautiful. Here's another one with the chariot as sort of a two-headed two pegasus. It's fine. It's, it's not quite within my taste. And I think there are two reasons why, while I love this deck and I, and I think it's beautiful and I would recommend it if someone said, should I get this? This is one I really, this is one of the few, I, this just reminds me of Shrek looking through a window. Um, sort of green eye looking out. Um, but if someone said, hey, you know, you, you have this deck, should I consider getting it? And I say, if you want it, like, go for it, because there's clearly a lot of effort that went into this. It's really beautiful. I think stylistically, ultimately, as I look at it, it's not, it's not, one of the things I look for in a deck, I guess, is that it's sort of, um, I, I have a feeling in my chest, you know, of like, yeah, this is, this, something's connecting to me with, with the deck. And that's just not happening with this one, and I think that's just chemistry. Um... And it, the weird thing about that feeling is that it happens all the time with decks I wasn't expecting. And decks I'm super excited about and don't sort of live up to it. The Joppa Rids is a good example. I wasn't really expecting to like that deck at all. And I turned out to really love it. So, so I think from a taste point of view, it's just not connecting with me. The other reason why I would say, and, and you know, this isn't a criticism... Um, and, I'll, and I'll talk about why, but I think it, in a lot of ways I feel like, looking at this deck, I feel like I already had it. And the reason why is because it reminds me a lot of, of two decks that I use pretty regularly, um, the Anima Mundi and the Wild Unknown. And sort of when I look at the two of these decks together, you know, 
Wild Unknown, pretty much black and white with some color highlights. The Anima Mundi, very much an oil paint, you know, rich oil painted deck. Oh, I did really need to back up. Um, stylistically, um, they're very similar, um, and I feel like in a weird way, these two decks were already answering the question that this deck wanted to ask. Um, you know, they're both animal-based, uh, but with some human elements in it. Um, the choices are very similar. I would say that both these two decks were heavily influenced by the Wild Unknown. And, and in another video recently, I, I, I think, I can't remember which one it was, but I talked about how the Wild Unknown really in its way has become its own system. And I think, you know, if I were to say anything now, I would say that there are a lot of decks that are coming out within this system, the Wild Unknown system, or style. And I think uh, the Anima Mundi is, it sort of bridges the gap between Waitsmith Smith and this uh, Wild Unknown style. And this, this is a little bit more on the Wild Unknown edge of things, but in a weird way, it just sort of... Um, they they felt it felt like I already had this this deck in a way because these two decks were sort of giving me that um, energy so I didn't I didn't necessarily need this and so it was an interesting thing to feel as I was looking through it because I'm like I love this deck why am I not connecting with it why does this you know and I think it's because I already you know it just it, it wasn't a gap in my collection and that's something I think you know as I think about collecting more decks and getting more, you know, I, I try to be really thoughtful about what I'm getting, but I'm a total impulse buyer. In fact, I impulse bought a deck this week, which I'm really anxious to show you. Um, but, you know, one of the things when I'm going back and forth, and I was going back and forth on the Naked Heart, is, you know, what I really need to do is look at walkthroughs of it and look at them and look at my collection and say, is this filling a gap um, in my collection that I don't you know, that I, that, I, that I need filled? Is there something that I'm missing in my collection that this deck could kind of give me that I'm not getting? And, and that's, that's a personal thing because I, I do not, you know, um, as, as Kelly from The Truth and Story says, nobody, you know, nobody says, why do you have so many books? So buying, you know, buying a lot of decks isn't problematic to me, aside from the fact that I'm running out of places to put them. What is problematic for me, personally, is that I have a lot of decks I love that I don't use because they get overshadowed by other ones. Um, and so I don't need any new decks. And um, it's an interesting thing in the buying process in that I probably should sit and say, is, you know, look at, look at decks and say, is this filling um, a need that I didn't know I had? Uh, <laughs> you know? Um, as at least a first guiding point. So, um, so my, my end thoughts on, on Tarot of the, um, uh, Naked Heart, Tarot of the Naked Heart, what's it called? Um, the Naked Heart Tarot is that it is a real work of art. I think it's beautifully produced. It's beautifully designed. The art is gorgeous. I would recommend it, you know, in a heartbeat to anyone who said, I'm thinking about this deck. It re it's really something I'm interested in. It's, I feel like it's something I've always wanted. I would say get it, you know, because you never know when um, independent decks are going to go out of print. Uh, but I also feel like for my for my collection, it just wasn't a need that I had, and it was really born more out of curiosity and sort of fear of missing out. Um, but that said, you know what I mean? That's that's all personal. It's 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 not that the, there's anything wrong with the deck. The deck's beautiful, uh, and I do recommend it. It's just you know, not feeling a void that was there. Um, it shuffles really well. Um, it actually shuffles, uh, uh, Riffle shuffles a little bit easier than the overhand because there is a little bit of a grip to the stock. Um, the other thing I'll say, if, if you're someone who gets bugged by this, um, I know there's probably no way to show this, but it is that kind of slightly waxy stock that when you do, when it gets sort of scratched against itself, it will show marks. But, you know, I like my decks to look like they've been used, so that doesn't remotely bother me. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, but it shuffles really beautifully. Um, and it looks nice when it's laid out, you know, if you were going to do a spread. It's nice and clean. It's matte, you know, which is something I always look for. It's another reason 
I got it because, you know, matte cards, because I do video readings almost exclusively, I'm always fighting light, trying to get enough light onto the table that the camera will not make the videos too dark, trying to get the light misdirected enough so that it doesn't spoil the image of the cards once I finally get them laid out. So, you know, I mean, it really does look beautiful and it's clear, it's easy to see, the font is creative without being, um, difficult to read. So in many, many ways, oh, and the Three of Hearts is, you know, it's an interesting solution. It's not the typical Three of, not the Three of Hearts, the Three of Swords. Uh, and I always appreciate that too. So again, it's a beautiful deck, but it's just, it's not answering a question that I had. It's not filling a void that I, I needed filled in terms of reading. And so uh, in that regard, it's probably not going to um, wind up in any regular rotation of mine. So... Uh, anyway, that's that. So that's a little review, not even little, this is like 25 minutes now, uh, review of two uh, new-ish decks, uh, the Carnival at the End of the World and the Naked Heart Tarot. Um, hope you're doing well, and we'll talk soon.